Our next presentation is about Indigenous mothers' experiences of intimate partner violence in rural, remote, and northern places. Um, this uh, presentation was developed by uh, Alana um, and Purtis. Um, Alana is a Alana Demke is a graduate student at the University of Saskatchewan, and she's going to lead this presentation for us. Thanks, Alana. Hello, everybody. Tom Say, Alana E.C. Kasprian, and today, Dr. Perdis Moffat and myself will be presenting on our research in digital mothering in the context of intimate partner events in rural, remote, and northern places. So we, we all know that femicide is a huge problem. That's why we're all here today. Um, for some, it's a larger problem than others, such as those who are Indigenous, uh, those who are mothers, and those who live in rural, remote, and northern places. If we consider each identity factor in isolation, we can see that the chances of a woman experiencing IPV are relatively high. If we combine these factors, those, cha those chances dramatically increase. There is a breadth of literature surrounding each factor. Even if you consider more than one factor, such as in just Indigenous mothers, there's still a lot of research on that. However, there is very little research on these three factors combined, despite how obvious that there's an increased need. So going into, the into this research, first we asked ourselves, what is mothering and how does Indigenous mothering differ? And although the differences are small, they're very important to highlight. In Indigenous context, mothering is not limited to relationships between a female parent and her biological offspring. Mothering as a relationship and a practice is a social and cultural act that occurs between multiple configurations of people of many generations individually and communally. So next to enhance uh, credibility, we situated our analysis in a theoretical framework of decolonial feminism, through which we examined our research, research through two avenues, that of mothering and multi-generational trauma and indigenous intersectionality. In terms of multi-generational trauma, prior to colonization, indigenous women and two-spirited people were held in high regard. Um, violence against women and children was taboo. However, colonization changed that. Women were stripped of their ability to provide for their families through traditional means. Some turned to marrying colonizers um, some turned and thus lost their status. Others turned to survival work, such as sex work. Others succumbed to the trauma of having their land, children, culture, and freedom stripped from them. Thus, colonizers held an opinion that others were unfit because they were unable to, help, to mother according to European ideals of mothering as well, and due to the overzealous restriction of the Canadian colonial state. As such, Indigenous women have a long and complicated history with Canada when it comes to their status as mothers. We only need to look at the forced sterilization in Alberta and Saskatoon and, calling, and the calling of child and family services as the new residential school in Canada. As it stands, Indigenous mothers perform mothering in the context of intimate partner violence is deeply situated in colonial context. Um, and next, we examine these women's experiences through the lens of their lens of intersectionality, which seems to be a huge theme throughout this conference. Uh, prior to Ken Crenshaw, Indigenous academic Zitala Saw wrote about Indigenous intersectionality and how Indigenous identity is inextricably tied to land, which ties in with the points above um, the land and access to it, so the ability to fish, to hunt, to move, to live was and is responsible for providing the raw material to maintain Indigenous life, with Indigenous women being responsible for producing that life. So land was targeted as were Indigenous women, as without them there are no Indigenous peoples. As a result, Indigenous women are bearing the brunt of representing these other political orders, the land itself, and other light forms and other sovereignty, while being simultaneously targeted because of these intersecting responsibilities. So towards our findings, um, or sorry, a quick note on methodology, unfortunately, due to time restrictions, we aren't able to go into it in depth, but if you would like to ask us questions about it, please come to our Q&A, we'll be available. Um, same thing with our demographics, as much as I would like to go into them a little bit further, um, we don't have the time, but we did have a total of 17 participants with a, with a average age at the, time, at the time of the interview of 41. And all of the average number of children was three. So on to our findings. Um, I'm sure many of us are familiar with Walker's 1979 theory of the of abuse. Um, we have found that in response to this violence, the Indigenous mothers have their own cycle, the cycle of comparative mothering. 
composed of three major themes. The comparative mothering is a responsive and embodied experience within a storied space. In one way, violence is normalized. In another, the vision of what normal is. This is a cycle of violence slowly removes the honeymoon phase through each repetition of the continuum. So too do these sub-themes become more normalized, strengthening the, the presence of violence in a woman's life. As the cycle of violence gets shorter, so too the more comparative mothering is built into a woman's idea of in mothering and identity. As we can see, the cycle of comparative mothering is a dangerous place to exist holistically. This is particularly important as the mental health and well-being of children is directly dependent and are directly tied to the mental health and well-being of their parents, particularly their mothers, as has been found by Buchanan 2013 and the National Collaborative Center for Aboriginal Health 2012 and more. However, all hope is not lost. Uh, at, this, at each stage of the cycle, there is a chance at ever intervention through the theme of cultural recovery. Composed of su five sub-themes, it is the goal of successful Indigenous mothering, the using of intergenerational and multi-generational strength. It serves to interrupt the process of comparative mothering through engaging with cultural identity practices. This interruption, interruption allows for the institution of Indigenous mothering to begin. While cultural recovery may not completely stop the process, it serves to loosen the influence and hold this violence takes on a mother's identity, offering the lasting impacts that it may have. So just to go through our themes a little, discuss our themes a little bit more, each, each sub-theme has a quote um, illustrating it from one of our, our, one of our um, survivors. Um, comparative mothering, um, so for each of these sub-themes, they share one common thread. There are themes that demonstrated the line between the normalization of violence and the striving for a standard defined by the colonial. The longer they exist in this space of violence, the more blurred this line becomes. In particular, we would like to bring your attention to traumatic head injury. 70% of our participants reported self-reported experiencing a traumatic head injury, which is especially, especially concerning considering our participants have limited or no access to hospitals or services that may um, address this as they're living in rural, remote, and northern places. Traumatic head injury was often an indication that their lives were not normal by any measure. Our first major sub theme under the, the major theme of comparative mothering is continuous hypervigilance. The repetitive nature of the violence mothers experience put them on the lookout for further dangers of violence in their own lives and the lives of their children. The common thread of these is that they are all beings, existence, are states of being in the violence. We would like to draw your attention to reading the signs in particular. Not only does it demonstrate that the strength of these women and the strategies they adopt, but it highlights the continuous state, the constant watching. These women are never able to just exist in a space storied by IPV. Next, our, our next sub-theme under comparative mothering is that of protecting nurturance. It is the state of mothering focused on protection and nurturing in the context of IPV relationships. The state on which they predicate their relationality with their children, themselves, their abusers, and others. We'd like to draw your attention to the tipping point. As many of our mothers describe um, being able to handle the violence when it's onto themselves, but being motivated to act only when they started to see the, the external effects of the abuse on their children manifesting or found their children being victimized. This demonstrates personal resilience as these women think they are doing their best by their children by keeping them in a normal family until they say wise, then that is enough. Our third and final sub-theme sub under comparative mothering is that of the pursuit of safety. Safety is an, plays an important role in leading, surviving, and mothering. It is the avenues of action through which mothers endeavor to maintain safety. We'd like to draw your attention in particular to course of control. It is the use of children as a threat, the use of your identity as a mother to control every aspect of your life heavily supported by the literature and with criminalization of it as an offense being considered is an all-encompassing tool used by abusers to ensure victim compliance. Finally, uh, where we look at our theme, intervention theme, cultural recovery. Just to reiterate, cultural recovery is the using of intergenerational and multi-generational strength through the engagement of, with cultural identity practices. And although an outlier, we'd like to draw attention to healing your little, um, it becomes, parents through my own teachings as well as a review of the literature that he, taking care of one's inner child is essential, is essential to healing which has been written about extensively. All of the sub-themes under cultural recovery share a common characteristic that is that they are interactive processes strengthened through our interactions with others and through continual reciprocity with Takua Nuwaku Maganak 
all my relations. And on Prudit. Okay, thank you so much. Indigenous mothering through severe partner violence and threats of death can be explained through comparative mothering, continuous hypervigilance, protective nurturance, pursuit of safety and cultural recovery. Comparative mothering is an aspect of mothering that responds to the concepts of normalizing violence and perspectives of normal for a good mother. This has been described in the literature, for example, by Bentley, describing how women prioritize their standard of mothering through what is going on to keep children safe and in the moment. However, Bentley speaks to, understand, to understanding that their circumstances are different than others' mothering. We still note that mothers are striving for this standard of what they think of as being a good mother. Cultural recovery is vital to healing. Indigenous scholars are writing about ceremonies and practices and relating their significance. For example, wedge-makers Schiff and Pellick recognize that healing from an Indigenous worldview involves a balance in four directions, physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual. Connection to spirit is the beginning of the healing journey for many Indigenous people. This is coupled with recognition of the universal connectivity of all creation. A balance of the four directions cannot be attained until a person has become aware of and responsive to the spiritual component of his or her own life and recognizes all my relations. Culturally based interventions are encouraged for healing. Next slide, please. As evidenced in our findings, mothers in violent context are on a high alert around the perpetrator and in order to protect their children and keep themselves and the children safe, especially for mothers in rural, remote and Northern places. Safety planning needs to be enhanced because women are often living in isolation and their formal resources are sometimes non-existent. There is a growing body of literature about mothering during IPV and Indigenous mothering. Similar findings have been reported in the literature by Bentley, as we said before, in their descriptions of attentive surveillance by Lacombe, by Letourneau, by Wiest and Merrick Gray. With every report in the literature, we are building on the importance of supporting mothers' vigilant behaviors in their decision-making to protect and nurture their children. By supporting mothers' hypervigilance, we are able to create more informed and personal safety plans with mothers and their children in an attempt to acknowledge their recognition of when danger is imminent and strategies to use for themselves and their children. Resilience-based narratives rather than trauma-informed narratives will advance the self-esteem of mothers. Many women do not want to have a victimized identity. Next slide, please. From the findings of this study, many mothers had experienced choking and strangulation and beatings to the head. There is a probability that they have sustained brain injury. It is most important for emergency physicians and care providers to recognize this possibility when IPV victims present to the emergency room. There continues to be an important need to educate frontline workers and the general population of the findings from this study about Indigenous mothering and the supports they require. There is of late a great deal of attention to coercive control and as evidenced in our findings, it is present for Indigenous mothers in rural, remote and Northern places. Addressing coercive control within Canada's criminal law is a consideration to explore and take action and or make recommendations about. We must carefully consider what is the best way forward to keep Indigenous women and children safe. Healing from severe violence involves taking care of the inner self. Next slide, please. More research will help us support Indigenous mothers who are facing intimate partner violence. Some thoughts are that we need to look at the differences between urban and rural, remote and Northern cultural recovery. Rural and remote Northern have greater access to the land while urban mothers may have greater service provision access. What about the women who have died? What are the long-term effects on children and mothers who have been murdered? 
How do you support women for whom violence has been normalized both internally and in the community? How do we address the lateral violence? There needs to be more research on the effects of traumatic brain injury in the context of IPV relationships and the access of treatment and care for TBI in rural, remote, and northern places. So that concludes our presentation. Uh, Masi Cho, and thank you. And I apologize for my camera not working. I have no idea why that happened. <laughs>